you. So I'm pl um, pleased to introduce you to our wonderful facilitator, Dr. Michelle Pekansky Brock, who is a leader in higher education with expertise in online teaching, course design, and faculty development. Dr. Michelle's work has helped online instructors across the US understand how to craft relevant humanized online learning experiences that, si that support the diverse needs of college students. In her current role for the California Community Colleges, she's coordinating statewide professional development in support of qual quality online teaching and learning. Um, so during this webinar, we will be linking you all to a survey to provide feedback. We'll be dropping the survey with about 30 minutes into uh, the webinar and then at 15 minutes um, after that. We ask you to please fill out the survey, let us know how we did, and to ensure that we keep creating programming that is tailored to your needs. Uh, lastly, at, at one, um, we do offer badges, as, um, but in this webinar, we do not offer badges as proof of completion, but we do provide um, badges for attending the webinar. Um, I'm sorry, I, I confused this a little bit. So lastly, at, at one offers badges as proof of completion for our courses. We do not provide a badge for attending this webinar. However, if your institution requires proof of attendance for credit or professional advancement, please remain until the end of the webinar, complete the survey, and request a copy of your responses to be sent through the Google form. Um, you can use this as confirmation and proof for your attendance. Like I mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and a copy will be made available on our website. So I will go ahead and um, pass it on to you, Michelle. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anwar, for that warm introduction. And um, welcome, everyone. It warms my heart to see all of these wonderful greetings in the chat. And if you haven't opened the chat yet, I just want to encourage you to do that. If it, if it serves you, if you find it distracting, keep it closed. Do whatever meets your needs. Um, this is humanizing in the AI era. And I'm taking a little bit of a different approach here uh, to humanizing, which has uh, been an, a notion, a, an a approach that has been central to the work that I and, and many of you do in um, higher education. And as I was waking up this morning, um, and looking at my phone, as I often do in the morning, I learned that today is uh, Mental Health Day, World Mental Health Day. And I just stepped back for a moment and I thought, I didn't even know that. And organizing this session on this day, it was just kind of a moment where I just kind of felt grateful for that. So I want to um, express that there's a lot of meaning wrapped up in this day, and um, I know that we all have a lot on our plates, and I want you to bring what you can to the next hour, and I want to honor your uh, your presence and uh, recognize that everybody is kind of here to a, a different degree, depending on what's going on in your life today. So on that note, I'm going to get us started, folks, with um, a little bit of a check-in. And what I'd like to ask you to do is either take out your phone and scan the QR code on the screen or click on the link that I'm going to put in the chat in just a second. If it's easier for, to, for you to click on the link, you're welcome to do that. And you should see a prompt that ask you to choose two words that describe how you're feeling today. And as your responses come in, they are generating the word cloud that you see on the screen. For those of you who may be new to word clouds, the more a word is contributed, the more a word gets added to the responses, the bigger it gets. So the, the scale of the word equates to the frequency that it's been submitted.
Okay, so I still see some responses coming in, but they're starting to slow down a little bit. So let's just reflect on what we're looking at. Um, the words that I see that are the largest are tired, overwhelmed, and excited. What I find so fascinating about this moment to check in and reflect on how everyone's feeling is how we see this coexistence of different types of emotions, right? We can be something, we can be tired and overwhelmed, and maybe we can also be excited at the same time. And right off the bat here, we're starting to time it, chime into some of our um, some of our lessons from this, this session that we'll be engaging in today. Now I've got one more question for you, okay? I've got one more question for you. And your screen should have just um, should have just changed, or maybe maybe folks already skipped over to it. Looks if you look at your screen again, it should now say, "How are you feeling about AI?" Um, Michelle, our results aren't coming up for us, so we can't see them. Oh, I'm not sharing that screen, huh? Okay, hold on. I forgot to click. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Anwar. Appreciate that. Sure, Karen, let me get that link for you. Hang on a second here. Okay, so I see things slowing down a little bit. I know some folks are still um, contributing and that's great. Uh, the largest word here is excited, overwhelmed. That's another return word. Um, and then I also see curious. It's a good word. I like the word curious. Okay. Yeah. So that kind of overwhelmed, tired fatigue, that's not surprising, not surprising at all. Um, we see folks who have joined this session that, you know, how are you feeling about AI? It, you're, 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 you've got some, some, you know, some real positivity that you're bringing into this, that you're leaning into this with, despite the fact that we're feeling tired and, and overwhelmed. So um, I applaud that. And I think that that's a great place to start. But I realize that's not how everybody feels, right? So if we look around at some of the other words on the screen, we'll see that there's a variety here. Okay, so I certainly want to, um, I certainly want to uh, make space for all of that. Karen, if you submit the first one, it'll prompt you to go to the second one. I think that's the way that works. Okay. Well, thank you for participating in that. Um, it's really important for us to, to take the time to check in with our emotions. Um, and when it comes to humanizing, this notion of emotions is really central to everything. So I wanna start off by talking about what I mean by humanizing, because I recognize that, you know, I don't know, 10 years or so ago, that wasn't a word that was used as frequently as it is today. And as we went through uh, the pandemic, humanizing became a lot more popular and it means a lot of different things to different people. So I wanna be very intentional just to, to, to specify that what humanizing means in the context of this webinar and more broadly in, in the work that, that I'm doing along with many of you out there, uh, it means centering this notion right here. We are not thinking machines, we are feeling machines that think. And that is a quote from Antonio Damasio referencing the research that he's done in neuroscience and what he and his colleagues have learned from it. Folks, the more we center this idea in every role that we play in our lives, as educators, as colleagues, as parents, as aunts, as uncles, as friends, siblings, children, the more we begin to live more fulfilled and balanced lives. Okay, so um, with that, we are going to be taking this concept and 
thinking about framing AI with that in mind. And I think one of the reasons why I wanted to present this webinar and hold space for this, these ideas with you to contemplate is because I don't always hear AI being framed in this way. Um, actually, I was at a presentation recently and I, I heard someone talk about leaning into the curve and using this metaphor, if you think about like when you're driving and if your car starts to spin out of control, um, what you're supposed to do to control your car is to actually lean into the curve, right? And and I first went, yeah, 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 that makes a lot of sense. And the more I thought about that, I was like, yeah, but that also means you have to go against everything that feels right in your body, right? Like it's 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 a very vulnerable place. And so it's important for us to make space and, you know, give grace to all of the feelings that uh, make space for all of the feelings that we have and give ourselves grace, you know, have empathy for ourselves. Because I know that oftentimes when you look at what other people are doing, it feels like you're just not doing enough yet. So um, I just want to be sure that we all acknowledge that. And then we're also thinking, thinking about how emotions are core to our survival as humans. And that's really true. That's very true. It's a fact. And we have AI companies leveraging our emotions in their work. So the way we respond to AI right now is really going to be central to the role that AI plays in our future. And I mean that broadly as, uh, as humanity, but also you as an individual. Um, and then something else we're going to do today is offer some suggestions for how you, if, if you're in a teaching role, can adapt your assignments to increase human connection in the AI era. So emotional AI may or may not be something that you've heard of before, but it is an emerging field. And despite the fact that emotion researchers um, have shown that we can't actually know exactly what a person is feeling by the way a person, by their expression or their vocal tone. Um, emotional AI uses large data sets collected from the way people respond. So the expression on your face, the vocal tone of different people who have been included in research to create algorithms that attempt to decode the feelings behind written words, a human voice, or a facial expression. The AI then adapts to the data input. A voice bot on a phone may change its script if the person on the other end sounds upset. You may see mental health resources appear if you're engaged with an AI and you look distressed. Learning materials could also adapt in response to a person's emotions. Emotional AI is also being used in the workplace to inform managers about the emotional state of employees. I'm not saying your workplace. I'm just saying that's part of what what's happening in this space. Now, there are some risks to this that I just really want to point out here. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, a person's emotional expression is not always an indication about how the person feels. We know that in general, people wear masks based on their social situation. Like for example, if my screen were to go black right now, I'd be really panicked inside, but I'd be intentional about trying to not look that way, right? Um, and so as a result, algorithms used in this space can create emotional stereotypes that get applied to all people. And these biases um, also come out in different ways. We know from existing use of emotional AI that there have been incidents where um, Black, Latina, and other people of color, basically the darker a person's skin is, the more likely they have been to be identified as displaying negative emotions. The situation actually recently led to Homeland Security removing emotional AI from airports because it resulted in racial profiling. We also know that culture influences verbal and nonverbal cues. So a smile or a pause in one speech means something very different in one culture versus another. People who are neurodivergent experience process and express emotions very differently from people who are neurotypical. And there are lots of other um, minoritized identities that get left out here. 
And then I would say the last um, risk to mention is that, of course, we risk having machines start to replace human interactions, which is really important in our survival and our well being. I'm going to play a one minute advertisement here, folks. Um, and I want to preface this with this is an advertisement for a product. Okay, so this is couched in the context of right, capitalism. Capitalism thrives off turning humans' fears and vulnerabilities into opportunities for new markets. So I'm gonna play this one minute advertisement for an emerging AI assistant that leverages emotional AI. And the name of that AI assistant, which you will see displayed front and center is Friend. So go ahead and watch and tell us what's happening, what you see. You can use the chat or just reflect on your own as you're watching. Gosh, I'm out of breath. You like this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on, come on. Oh, let's go! Are you serious? Take notes, baby. Let's go, let's go. Maybe I should get into sculpting again. I mean, I could do this. Woo! <laughs> I don't know how to woo very good. All right, let's go. Let's go. That's right. Bro, you look like the back of oh, the man, you guys suck. Dude, what? How did you do that? Yeah, Kim responds, uh, reminds me of the movie Her to some extent. Uh, let's see. Ellie says, this makes me want to cry. Piper says, yikes. Um, Tiffany, I see your question about ethics, and it's a great one. I'm thinking who wants to wear a giant life alert deal around their neck. Yeah, they'll have to make that more fashionable, huh? Um, Eric says, incomplete, so creepy, whoa, dangerous. I see this as a slippery, slippery slope, yeah. Okay, so you can keep reading in the chat. Thank you for all these contributions. We've got a big group here today, which is great, um, but I won't be able to read them all um, back. Yeah, humans codependent on technology. Um, folks, this to me, like, made my skin crawl <laughs> when I first saw it. I mean, that was my reaction, and it also made me very sad. It still makes me very sad. Um, particularly when I think about young people, and we're going to continue this conversation about young people. And I also want to point out that this is not the worst of it. Um, I'm not going to get into this because I think it's very triggering for a lot of people, including me. Um, but there's a whole field coming out called grief tech, and it's using emotional AI to support mourners through the loss of loved ones. Um, and I'm not going to give specific examples. If that's something you want to learn more about, you can look up grief tech. But there's a lot happening right now. And I think that we all need to be really critical um, about its the impact of these technologies. So human emotions are varied. They, they feel good. They feel bad. They feel every way in between. And when we suppress our pain, we suppress our grief, we suppress our loneliness, they don't, it doesn't go away. It just comes out in other ways. Emotions should not be a commodity. It's my opinion that they, they won't be a commodity for me. That's, that's how I will approach my life, but they are being targeted as such. Emotions are what separate you from a machine. And I want to say that emotions are your superpowers in the AI era. How we frame AI and respond to it will change the course of our futures. I want to pause there for a second. Okay, so moving forward, why are emotions being so highly targeted by AI companies? We're social creatures. Humans crave affirmations from other humans in every situation, whether it's walking into a new room, logging into Zoom, starting a new class, whether you're the teacher or the students. 
attending a meeting, going to the mall. We long for social inclusion and affirmation from those around us in little ways and in big ways. In little ways without even knowing it, our brain scans our environment for these cues. And when we need authentic connection, and we need authentic connection with other people, human connection can be thought of as human fuel. It motivates us in the work we do every day. It motivates our students in the learning that they do and every other aspect of their life. And it enables us to thrive. But we live in a culture where our basic needs may be stifling depending on who we are. In 2023, just a year ago, the US general surgeon put out this report and identified the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. In this report, it was shown based on data, and this has been data that has been coming in for decades, one in two US adults are lonely. There's a loneliness scale um, that people complete to assess this, by the way. And we have disproportionately impacted groups, our transgender and gender diver diverse individuals, Hispanic, Black, low income. Starts to sound familiar after a while, doesn't it? And then young adults age 18 to 24. Now, these um, minoritized communities have appeared in the, the research for, for, for quite some time, and I don't want to belittle that, but what I, I do want to point out that was that is startling in the most recent years is the surfacing of young adults. And in the, the latest data, 79% of young adults age 18 to 24 compared to 41% of adults 66 and older report as lonely. And um, this is startling. This is different. This is just very different from the kind of loneliness we had in previous decades and in previous years. Today's loneliness is different from the loneliness of previous generations. It used to be an experience of people who were physically isolated from one another. And rates of loneliness used to be higher among elderly people for this reason, right? Because we start losing our, our our partners, our loved ones, our family as we get older. But now people are lonely when they're with other people. Today, more people are even lonely when they're with their families. Workplace research shows that loneliness negative Im negatively impacts job satisfaction as well. It decreases work productivity. And a 2015 meta-analysis of studies about loneliness found that feeling lonely increases the odds of dying by 45%, which the Surgeon General report specifies as the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, when we think about why are things like this, a lot of times people point to COVID and sure, certainly that's, that, that's part of the, the mix. Um, but as I mentioned, as I think I mentioned, these rates were going up before COVID. So uh, technology often plays a role um, and that's certainly been cited. And I don't wanna say technology as a blanket because we can't think about technology that way. There are technologies that help people foster more connections. I'm someone who greatly benefits from that because I've worked at home for 14 years and I feel very connected to people. Um, and a lot of it is through technology. And a lot of the people on this call today, I feel connected to and I've never even met you before in person. So we need to be cautious about that. And the same goes true for online classes and we'll get into that more in just a bit. Um, yes, but social, social media and comparison is a, is a big influencer and the use of phones in the presence of other people instead of having conversations is a big influencer. We've also had societal changes. Um, this quote from the report says, our distant ancestors relied on others to help help them meet their basic needs. Living in isolation or outside the group means having to fulfill the many difficult demands of survival on one's own. This requires far more effort and reduces one's chances of survival. Despite current advancements that now allow us to live without engaging with others, 
our biological need to connect remains. And that bold face is added by me. I want us all to be mindful that it is a biological need for a human to connect with other humans. The Surgeon General Report goes on to specify that human connection is an antidote. Um, and I love this, this quote here. Each of us can start now in our daily lives by strengthening our connections and relationships. Our individual relationships are an untapped resource, a source of healing, hiding in plain sight. They can help us live healthier, more productive and more fulfilled lives. Answer that phone call from a friend, make time to share a meal, listen without the distraction of your phone, perform an act of service, express yourself authentically. The keys to human connection are simple, but extraordinarily powerful. And I wanna to add to that list, go outside. There's research that just shows a green space, helps us to connect with our community more, connect with nature, which actually fulfills, um, is, is, is also connected, uh, related to this, this sense of connection. Okay, one more quote for you. Um, this is from Daniel Goleman, author of Social Intelligence. Uh, he wrote, we are designed for sociability, constantly engaged in a neural ballet that connects us brain to brain with those around us. Our reactions to others and theirs to us have a far reaching biological impact, sending out cascades of hormones that regulate everything from our hearts to our immune systems, making good relationships act like vitamins, and bad relationships act like poisons. All relationships are not the same, okay? And that's a really important point, particularly when we start thinking about classes and teaching and learning. We have students coming into classes that have had bad relationships that have acted like poisons. And so when they come into a new class, they may not be entering from a place of trust, right? And that is something that we as instructors need to think about and center in the early moments of our class. This also gets into the importance of belonging, which is part of this landscape. Belonging is a deep connection within social groups and individual and collective experiences. It's counter to loneliness. And it's, it's widely accepted that belonging is a basic human need from research in higher education, we know that students who belong are more likely to finish a class, they're more likely to come back the next term, and they're more likely to achieve their academic goal. Belonging is derived through human connection and it's sometimes associated with fitting in, but I see these things very differently, fitting in and belonging. I think about fitting in as a dignity violation. When a person feels the need to fit in, they're cued to change who they are. Fitting in is a stressful, hurtful, and toxic experience. And there's been research done that shows it actually triggers the same parts of the human brain as physical pain. Belonging on the other hand is being accepted for one's true authentic self. And that's a privilege that many people do not have. So, Online classes, let's talk about them because some of you might be thinking all of this is an argument to not have online classes. And I want to, I want to push back on that idea. It is true. There is, there is research that shows learning online can increase in uh, isolation, which factors into loneliness. But it comes down to how we design and teach a class. And this is something that me and a large group of individuals, I saw Kim Vincent Layton from uh, Cal Poly Humboldt on the call. I haven't scanned all the names here, but hello, Kim. I wanna just make space for you. Kim was one of our my co-PIs on a grant that I'm about to tell you about. Um, and like I said, I can't scan all the names, but Benny, I see you. And Benny Ng was one of our participants in the, the academy that I'm about to introduce to you. So about five and a half, years ago, um, a group of us came together and asked the question, what would happen if asynchronous online STEM classes were designed and taught to incorporate cues of social inclusion and intentionally foster belonging for diverse students? 
What would that look like? What would faculty need to know how to do? What does the research say about this? These are the questions we were asking. And we wrote a grant proposal and we got funded. Um, and we developed something called the Humanizing Online STEM Academy that was funded through the California Education Learning Lab and administered by Foothill De Anza CC District. If you wanna learn more about this project, you can go to humanizeol.org. So the Humanizing Online Grant Projects, because we ended up getting two grants, one that lasted three years and one that lasted two years, um, just roughly to give you a sense of what we did, we first developed humanizing. It, was, it's, it is a research-based instructional model for online classes, and we designed and piloted a Humanizing Online STEM Academy, which is a six-week asynchronous professional development program. We scaled that to California community colleges and CSUs. We researched, we did research on the faculty who completed the academy as well as the students in their online classes and shared the academy and resources. And then in our follow-up grant, our scaling grant, we continued to scale and research. To date, 300 and, we've had 330 academy completions across 19 institutions in California, including 15 California community colleges and four California state universities. And that infographic on the left um, is on the site that I referenced, humanizeol.org, and you're welcome to go there and dig deeper if you want to learn a little bit more about, about what faculty learned about. I want to highlight what we learned from our research, right? So what would happen if we did this? Well, we found lots of different influential impacts on faculty. We saw significant changes in faculty perceptions, attitudes, and practices. There was a significant increase in recognition for the role that emotions and belonging play in STEM success. A lot of times we hear that that's, that's not part of STEM. At least that's something that I've heard. That's a kind of a narrative that I've heard over the years. We also saw a significant increase in faculty awareness of how the instructional environment, so the teaching the, and the learning, the teaching as well as the course design shapes students' emotions and belonging and an increase in the belief that students that's in the belief of students capability to succeed in general. So a real shift in kind of a deficit mindset towards a more asset based mindset when it comes to students and their abilities. And we saw changes in teaching. We saw increased flexibility, more use of audio and video. And this is where the, the the biological factors of the human brain, the desire for humans to seek out voices and faces, smiles, non gesture or nonverbal and verbal cues. When you're at, in a place of psychological threat, that's an important part of this. Um, and more opportunities for student to student interactions. Now on the student side, we saw high rates of belonging in humanized online STEM classes, particularly students from racially minoritized groups. They saw a larger increase in belonging from the start to the end of a class, which according to the research, um, racially minoritized students start with lower sense of belonging. So that's a positive finding. Reduced racial and ethnic equity gaps. And that is a brand new finding that we're happy to share. Um, and that was using a pre-post study with a control group, which makes that a more valid um, finding. We also uh, saw increased overall success rates in all course modalities, so that all courses taught by the faculty members, even though the academy was designed for asynchronous online classes, we saw increases in overall success rates across all modalities in, the stu in one study, with significant increases among women and Latino students. And um, I'm going to play this video, at least part of this video. I'm running a little short on time just to, because I, I really want to take this opportunity to center some students, and I think that you'll appreciate it. As educators, we know that relationships are the heart of our work. That's why we're teachers. We care about our students, and we want them to be successful. 
The Humanizing Online STEM Academy has had a profound impact on how faculty have been able to support our students. So the Online STEM Academy provided faculty step-by-step -step directions and inspiration on how they could leverage technologies to create really powerful interactions with their students. As a result of me taking the academy, I would say one big change I see is an increase in communication with my students. So if something sort of goes wrong with them taking the class and sometimes they might just silently unenroll and disappear, now they reach out to me and I've seen a major increase in retention due to that increase in communication. There was a video in the Liquid Syllabus that, you know, Professor Choate took the time to sort of introduce yourself, give us a breakdown of like how the class was going to work, what to expect. Seeing Professor Cho in that video just helps me feel less anxious. It matters that an instructor cares because my first year here, I was super overwhelmed. I didn't know how to communicate. I thought it was organized already, but I had no idea. If you don't have a support system, you feel like you want to give up. There are students that were in my classroom that would want to ask but they just didn't. Professor Cho actually has one of the nicest layout in Canvas that I've ever seen. It was really organized. She provided additional lectures that we could watch videos on and, and sort of just dive a little deeper into the topics to understand. The class was by far one of the most challenging classes I've taken so far. So having the opportunity to go back and listen to her lectures once more made it that much easier to overcome some of the challenges. So it was nearing the beginning of the semester, pretty much just Professor Ayuk and I in the lab, and he then wanted to ask me what my major was. and was probably interested to see that I was not an engineering major or a physics major or anything related to that. Fast forward five quizzes into the semester, I received a quiz back. Instead of commentary on how I could improve or something with an exclamation point at the end, consider majoring in three different engineering majors or physics, all caps. A few weeks following that, he then proceeded to ask, so did you consider changing your major? <laughs> And so I thought that was very encouraging and very motivating. Now, no, I didn't change my major, but just knowing that my efforts were paying off in this course that was difficult for me was definitely very rewarding. One time, I got a lower score on my second exam than my first exam, so she reached out to me and asked me if everything was good. As a student, we have a lot of things going on in our life. It showed that she doesn't only care about my learning, but me as a human being. Because of that one little thing that she reached out to me, that made me do even better on my third exam. It's Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I, I had to get that one in because that was my favorite one, right? We see how these interactions, how these positive interaction and these affirmations, the things we say to students, right? Um, really make a difference in motivation and make a difference in them believing that they can do it. Um, I'm going to share the link to my slides. Does that work for you? And the video is on the slides. I see that request. And I also want to just um, share that um, <laughs> I'm really loving the chat and I can't stay on top of it because if I do, I will be completely derailed. So thank you for all the interactions. I, and I can't wait to go back and revisit yeah. it later. I see some conversation happening about AI and I think that's great. Um, so a transformative uh, takeaway for us, if you talk to any one of us that have been, that have been involved with this um, immense project, the Humanizing Online STEM Academy, I think that um, Mike Smedshammer was one of my co-PIs, Kim Vincent Layton, as I mentioned, was one of my co-PIs, Ali Olson Pacheco serves as, served most recently as our instructional designer. And we have a, a uh, about four other facilitators that have joined on. I think every single one of them would agree that a transformative takeaway for participants is this idea that critical care and challenge can and should coexist. We have this sense of kind of like in our culture, you either can be soft and caring or you're tough. And that's wrong. Um, and I also want to mention this fantastic book that I've just started reading, but it's by Sarah Rose Cavanaugh and it's called Mind Over Monsters. And she centers, it's, it's uh, Mind Over Monsters Supporting Youth Mental Health with Compassionate Challenge. So there's a lot of overlap there with her notion of co compassionate challenge. And this 
Combining care and challenge, um, yes, it comes from warm demand or pedagogy, Kim, I think that's what you're mentioning, or warm encouraging pedagogy, uh, which comes from the work of Judith Kleinfeld all the way back in the 1970s, and her research stems from research done on Indigenous students, who's successful and what does that teaching and learning environment look like. So. Um, it's it's not like brand new stuff, but it's thing it, it's an approach that isn't integrated enough into higher education. And when we're serving diverse students, it becomes even more important. So if you work at a community college or an access oriented institution, I'm talking about you. So your authentic self is your advantage in the AI era. OK, that's that's my fundamental belief. Um, this slide here, you have access to the slides. You can click on and explore some liquid syllabi. That's one of the eight elements of humanizing that faculty created through the academy. It's a very hands-on program. So it's increasing faculty digital fluency and having them create psychologically inclusive course um, materials that they integrate into their course design. Um, I want to read this quote from a student. Uh, this was sent to one of uh, a professor who, who um, was employing the liquid syllabus. The student writes, I just had to reach out and tell you that reading through your syllabus and watching your welcome video literally brought tears to my eyes. I cannot tell you how many times I've attempted to take this English course and not completed because I have been too overwhelmed. I am a mom to two young children and between raising them, working full time, trying to balance my marriage and chase after my longtime dream of becoming a nurse. College has not been an easy journey for me. I've been dreading this semester because I have several rigorous courses and chose your English course because this semester, this semester purely based off zero cost materials. Good to know. You normalize not having a particularly straight path, perfectly straight path. You've given me so much hope for this course and others I'm taking. And it's been a wonderful reminder to keep my goals and dreams in sight and keep pushing through when you just don't think you can do it anymore. Thank you. I really look forward to learning from you this semester. Hopeful, bringing hope into a student's experience before they even start your class. That's the impact of seeing a brief imperfect video, uh, your instructor welcoming you. But folks, this is actually something I woke up to this morning. I got this in my inbox and I thought it was interesting that they're calling this superpowers. I love Canva. I use Canva all the time. Canva integrates an AI um, and I'll show you what it's doing. What it allows for you to do now if, if you have, I think, a premium account. DID's AI presenters have arrived in Canva. Thanks to this new integration, millions of Canva users can now quickly and easily add AI presenters to all of their creations. Just click on the app and start creating. From stunning presentations to jaw-dropping social media posts, we are giving creators new superpowers. Create more exciting and engaging videos with lifelike AI. Okay, so... AI video bots have landed and they're going to keep flying around. And, you know, if I were to hear from a faculty member like, oh, that video takes so much time for me to create. Why should I do it when I can just use a bot? So I want to say that if your intent when you're using video is to build human connection, which is what the examples I'm sharing with you are about, then a bot is not going to do that if it looks like another person or if it looks like you. And um, let me show you something. This is this is my video for my liquid syllabus. And I just want you to look closely at this video. Hi there, I'm Michelle Pekansky Brock. Thanks for taking a few moments to check out our liquid syllabus and for watching this video. I want you to know just a few things about me before we get started with the class and start learning together. First of all, I am a teacher at Okay, that's me. That's me. I recorded that with my phone in my backyard. Now here's another one. Hi there, I'm Michelle Pekansky Brock. Thanks for taking a few moments to check out our liquid syllabus and for watching this video. I want you to know just a few things about me before we get started with the class and start learning together. First of all, I am a teacher at Do you heart. Notice anything I different? love to teach and I really love to teach online. So I wanna be sure that you know I'm here because this is something I really enjoy doing. 
I also want you to know that I understand it's hard to. What was the difference there? That was a digital twin. <laughs> what was that one? What was the difference between what you saw in that one and the one before though? Describe it to me. My mouth, the warmth is gone. Thank you, Paula. This looks like jib jab. <laughs> Robot Michelle, eyes, limited movement. Those are all the cues. All the things that are missing are the cues that humans seek out when they're in a space of psychological threat. And I want you to know this. This is what the research shows. Humans can feel psychologically safe. They can feel psychologically unsafe. And that's when there's clear cues. Maybe there's microaggressions or macroaggressions around you, or you can feel uncertain. And uncertainty comes when there's no cues. And that is when the human brain stays in its space of the most active scanning. And when the brain is scanning, it's using the same bandwidth that it needs for learning. That is a barrier for every single student who enters a class with some sense of self-doubt or trauma from their past experiences. So that's central to our work. And it's so important that it's been something, it's been a really powerful outcome of, of this Hi humanizing there. I'm work. Michelle. So I, I, I didn't like doing this to my video, but I thought it would serve a purpose. And I didn't know how to do it to anyone else ethically. So there you have it. Did anyone feel weird watching that? Did it kind of creep you out? Anyone? Okay. I see one. Yes. Two yeses. Three, four. Okay. You were just in, if you felt creeped out, what's known as the uncanny valley. This is a thing. And it was actually coined way back in the 1970s, 1970s, by robotics professor Masahiro Mori. The uncanny valley is not a place for learning, folks. What it is, is it's basically humans are comfortable with inanimate objects until they get to look too human. And then we push back and that's what the uncanny valley is. It's like, there's just, there's just curve come. Okay. I'm okay. And then nope, not okay anymore. And when we're in this space, that is your human instinct pushing back. We are not taught in this culture to sense instinct and to believe in it. It's more important now than ever. So I want you to remember the uncanny valley. If you feel that in the future, know what's happening, okay? Because we have to rely on our biological instincts in order to fulfill our, our, our well-being and live long, healthy lives. So human connection, as I've centered here, um, it, it is an antidote for our mental health crisis, and it's also a way to close inequities and in educational outcomes, all right? That's been shown. There's evidence for both of these things. So I wanna ask the question, how might we increase human connection and intrinsic motivation through the design of our courses and in the workplace? And I'm gonna to have to leave you to kind of ponder that one, but I think it's really important. Here are some shifts that we're seeing. These are shifts. If we kind of take a bird's eye view of what's happening around the nation with teaching and learning in higher education, here are some shifts that have happened in the past year. We're starting to see a shift from approaching um, gen, gen AI in the classroom through a lens of detection and moving towards AI integration into assignments. We're also starting to see a shift from rigid policies that ban AI in the class to transparent and contextual guidance. On the last slide that of the slide deck, you're, you, there's a link to something called the AI Assessment Scale, AI Assessment Scale by Perkins et al. Et al. It's a wonderful resource to consider using in your classes to to, for, this, to, for transparent and contextual guidance. It communicates to students how they may use AI for every single assignment. And it may say none, but there's a, a whole scale. And a shift from product to process. A shift from product to process. And what that means is instead of just submitting a final product, we're now starting to look for evidence of the student's process, right? Which is actually an effective way to promote learning in general. Um, but it's, it's something that we're starting to see more and more of in teaching and learning in the AI era. 
And what I want to say is that um, all of these things are done more effectively when faculty take on relationships that are anchored in relational authority instead of positional authority. And this, again, ties back to this warm demander concept. So those of you familiar with that are going to understand how those relate. Positional authority is derived from one's formal role or title. I'm the professor. Here's my policy. You do it, right? Based on hierarchical structure and backed by organizational policies. Relational authority earned through trust and respect, built through interactions, and based on personal qualities and expertise. It's a very different model. Qualities of a warm demander are personal warmth, active demanding, and affirming effort and ability. So designing learning for human connections. What if we in Canvas designed assignments and included instructions or rubric, right? We're used to that. You, and maybe encourage students to use AI to do something like brainstorm topics or ideas. And then had students take that assignment and following your prompt, leave you know, the, the course environment and interact with friends, family, and their community. Talk with people, go outside. I know a lot of you already do this and you're thinking, I've been doing this for years in my teaching. This is a wonderful way to increase intrinsic motivation, curiosity, creativity, and get students away from just turning to AI. So things like hands-on projects, interviews, conversations with people that they know, surveys for data collection, with permission to share, if they're sharing this, their, their process or their, the, 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 if there's another human in the product that we need to have permission to share in there. And then you come back into Canvas and you know this is just a, I'm just throwing this out here as a model, an idea, but perhaps they submit their process documentation, documentation in that first assignment. And then they go over to a discussion and share what they made. They share their findings, they share their interview, they, they share their conversations, their hands-on projects whatever it is that they've, they've created. And there's student to student interactions there, right? So there's a prompt to have them dig deeper and interact with each other. And then in the next module, they come back and they have another assignment to go back and reflect, review and reflect on all of that content that's been brought into the class. And then that becomes the content that they're analyzing and producing some type of, of learning artifact about. Yeah, Jennifer, I, I hear you. Um, I love making videos, but it can be hard to make all the videos accessible. Um, Canvas is in the process of redesigning their um, their video recording tool. I don't have a lot of details, but it's supposed to roll out within the next calendar year and include auto captioning. So um, in, in all the different places that, that videos show up in Canvas. So in doing this, we might want to also consider something like incorporate the social connection fact cards. With, these are actually provided alongside the um, Surgeon General's report, and they've got data about why it's good to get out and talk to, to other people and engage with the community, right? So building that self-awareness and that, that, uh, that emotional uh, capacity of students at, through, through sharing knowledge like this and normalizing discussions about well-being. Um, this is a little recording of one of my students. Um, when I teach the history of photography, I have students, I ask them, what can we learn about the past and present from photographs? And to have them spark um, ideas around this, I have them actually engage with, with people they know to find a, an old photograph that relates to them in some way. It could be a, a community photograph, it could be a family photograph. And so here's a, a little Hi student everyone. comment. So this is a photo of my grandmother, Mariarita. I got this photo from my mother. And uh, this is a picture of when she was one year old. And I believe it was taken in 1917. 
I'm going to pause that just for the sake of time, but she goes on to talk about how it, she, she actually had this interaction with her mom on Mother's Day, and it was a really meaningful interaction, right? And so that comes back and it, it that that intrinsic motivation really fuels her curiosity and interest in photo in photography much more beyond you know looking at pictures that i put out there and have them and ask them about Hi, so um that's just an example that i thought i'd i'd include I want to encourage all of you, and I know many of you are already doing this, and I saw some references earlier in the chat to this, but AI, AI is a fantastic way to brainstorm teaching ideas if you're not doing this yet. If you're thinking, how can I do that in my class? I have a prompt here. This is a screenshot of me entering this prompt into an a generative AI named Claude, which is the, the one that I prefer to use. And that prompt says, act as a course designer for a community college astronomy course. The goal is to brainstorm ideas for learning activities that foster interactions with friends, family, and or get students outside in their community slash nature. So you can replace astronomy with your course title or topic. This is just part of the list that, they, that the AI provided me. It doesn't mean that I'm going to take this and run with them. It means it's going to spark ideas for me. And I thought it was pretty darn cool. So um, someone else mentioned um, Conmigo, I believe, and Conmigo has some wonderful free teacher tools that will at some point be integrated into Canvas, and that might be something you want to explore as well. So here's that prompt. I have it on the slide for you if that's something you want to dig into and explore and attempt to, to work on in your own. I want to encourage you to do that. And I have some resources on the screen here um, as well, some CCC AI leaders you can follow and learn from, as well as some resources that I mentioned, most of which I mentioned earlier. I also want to point out that CVC at One has an AI webinar series, uh, which you may already know about following this one, presented by Jose Antonio Bowen, author of Teaching with AI. They start very soon. Um, and I'm sure that those are going to be very re rewarding and helpful. So I want to encourage you to lean in and, and participate in those if you think you'd benefit from them. We have three minutes left, and I'm happy to take a question if there's one that has come to the surface. There's one that just came in. How long does, uh, or I guess that might be response to someone else's question. Karen, that should be automatic. If it's not working, you can send me an email. I'll put my email in chat. I provided the link for the webinars that are upcoming. Awesome, awesome. Because I saw that question come in. Is there a particular question? Um, can you please give us a slideshow link? A few people asked for that if you want to drop it. We will be also posting the recording and the slideshow link on the CBC at one website. I believe Bita had a question about, do you have an update on the next humanizing studies? I'm not sure if you already got around to that. Um, Bita, the, I included our, our main findings in that slide, but we are going to have another research brief be added to our humanizeol.org site on the research page in December. So you can drill in and read more findings there. Thanks for asking. Good to see you. So should I stop recording? I think so.